Tatanji didn't choose some ginandone, any didn't change you sem seadi, any didn't change you sem in it, that didn't tony to be sure of in it, canje di sungo yeg in Engado, so di that casure. Candra did it to what's sick? Jitter Shumpatishim or the Rodopon did to him in such. Um, that show can read it heavy in air, lagger can read it heavy in air, catch you should be. Did it to your residue and many other twenty hours? Tiggy Dilia interest laborers. Michigi, the catch and rest lamb, digits on draw my imba. Midi catch and rest lamb, do some catch and chug do me do te. So so in your cool good doom in the day. And in your course of your shula, and a dig to hot mason, toads and yewris. As you can say, inji gay mason, flavors or but that dig it tasty. The yewris, yes, on Robert Jiggy, dig it chedu, and didn't choose some say it. Chabin or some goyag, me you do the Jasanga, as you appetizers on which it was. <laughs> so now, uh, Rinpoche mentioned the three phenomena indicated here. That is the technical term in Tibetan. Now, the three phenomena indicated here, they're indicated in the first verse, and they are so I, I'll speak a little slower. I've, I was asked to speak a little slower, so I'll try and remember now. So just in case you wonder why. Um, anyway, so these three are the ones Rinpoche mentioned before, great compassion, non-dual cognition, and contrived bodhicitta. There are these three phenomena, the three uh, um, aspects that are mentioned here. Now actually, whichever practice we do, whichever Dharma practice we do, or even in our daily life, whatever work we engage in, it's important for us to develop some interest, to, to develop some kind of uh, taste for it, like a sense of why is this important, or is this important or not? For us to see, is this to, relevant to me or not? Is this something I need or not? Is this something uh, that helps me in some way or not? In other words, to get a flavor or to get some uh, sense of its importance. And this is also, well, for that purpose, as an appetizer, as Rinpoche called it, these three phenomena, these three aspects indicated here are set forth. So compassion and so forth. Mm -hmm. Then Chanjug Semda, the then Tony to be sheriff. Ah, Nigalogi, and a Nola Dokoyach, Tawat, Tawat of Jess, Dian, and the Neodua, Chazanga, hm, on a Ningi, Ningi di Mavina, and a Ninjun Tatus Lamidurba, Ninjun Yawaski Matuba, Ninjun Yawaji, my dear Massa. Tunitovishere now, therefore, with regard to these three, well, they serve as a cause, as a cause of actual spontaneous bodhicitta. And what is important to understand is that 
before we can generate bodhicitta, we need to generate compassion and we need to generate the non-dual cognition or the, uh, the understanding of emptiness, the mind that understands emptiness. They need to be developed first or at least have some sense of what emptiness refers to. And without compassion in general, it's not possible to generate what is called renunciation, uh, an understanding of emptiness, or even, and, and of course, bodhicitta. And with regard to compassion, therefore, uh, it's important to remember also what His Holiness has said about the question, uh, is this something we can do about suffering? What is the root cause of suffering? And secondly, uh, the answer, the solution to that. So looking at the, or um, taking some time with a question and to also uh, taking some time to find out the answer, to find what the answer may be. I asked Mumbaji actually a question. I said, Are you saying that compassion needs to precede renunciation? And Rumbaji actually answered this question just now. He said, Well, in Tibetan, compassion usually refers to compassion towards other sentient beings. But in a broader sense, the way it is explained in the West, for instance, uh, it's also compassion for oneself. Therefore, in order to generate renunciation, you first need to generate compassion, which indicated by what Rinpoche said, it is compassion directed at oneself. And in that sense, it would explain why renunciation needs to be preceded by compassion. Tawana Tang then the next aspect, uh, Rinpoche um, discuss, or wants to uh, discuss here is about the three types of compassion from the point of view of being, be being important in the beginning, being important in the middle, and being important at the end. Now, the way this is described uh, is that compassion at the beginning is like planting the seed, planting the seed of compassion that is considered to be compassion important at the beginning. Then you have compassion that is like watering the seed. Compassion that is uh, important in the middle. It's like watering the seed in the sense of preserving, maintaining that compassion. Uh, to not lose com the compassion, make to make sure that we don't lose compassion, but instead be able to maintain it, be able to uh, continuously um, allow for it to arise in our continuum. And then lastly, you have compassion that is important at the end, 
which is at the time of the result, the resultant state of a Buddha. It's compared to harvest, like ripen of, of uh, reaping the fruits, reaping the fruits in the sense of, well, the harvest has grown after a lot of hard work, you now get the result that you can now spontaneously manifest as a Buddha, that a Buddha can spontaneously manifest that type of compassion. And compassion that is um, like a seed is like our compassion as beginners. When we are beginners, we, we plant the seeds of compassion in our mental continuum. So we start with this practice of compassion. And then compassion that is important at the, in the middle, that is for those, uh, those practitioners on the bodhisattva path who have reached the first four level or the first who have reached the four levels before the fifth level, which is Buddhahood. So the Bodhisattva path can be divided into four paths, different paths, which are called the path of accumulation, the path of preparation, the path of seeing, and the path of meditation. So accumulation, preparation, seeing, and meditation. Those are four levels a Bodhisattva goes through before reaching what is called the path of no more learning, which is the state of Buddhahood. And so compassion, which is like watering the seed, watering a seed, is compassion on the path of accumulation all the way up to the path of meditation. And then the last type of compassion that is like the ripened fruit or the, 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 the harvest, that is like, bodhic is like compassion in the continuum of a Buddha. The spontaneous kind of, sp kind of uh, compassion in, in the Buddha's uh, mental continuum. When, <clears throat> when we hear about no more learning, it's so good, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, actually that's true. It's, the, many uh, friends, when I share Dharma, their question is, is there something very short, <laughs> very like essence are there, but we don't need to study so much. And then in a short period, and that actually they are asking, kind of like, no more learning. <laughs> they don't want to learn. <laughs> the problem about uh, before no more learning is the habit, changing the habit. So we cannot change the habit and then you wanted a shot and everything. You can do the practice, but you, are, you do thousands or thousands of retreats, prostrations, or any kind of uh, uh, practices you do, you are still the same as who you are before. So for that, uh, I think uh, when we talk about uh, part of uh, uh, accumulation and the part of preparation, and then after that, part of meditation is a bit longer. Why? Because changing the habit. So that is the something that we need to pay attention. So when you, if you can change your habit very quickly, then you can get a, the shot instantly, uh, not just like for maybe three year, three month retreat, perfectly fine, works very instantly. But we, all the question is, uh, you have to ask yourself, is this habit is changing or not? So for that, uh, we really need to adapt the way of Bodhisattva's life, how the Buddhist, Bodhisattva's uh, practice. So like, why this book becomes so thick? The person who is writing this, he, he does not have an intention to make this book very complicated. But it becomes complicated because while we look, we cannot get the taste out from this. And then we feel like, okay, this is hard, let's skip this. And then it doesn't make any sense. 
oh, this is good. Then what you get is only one or two pages out of that, but it's all connected. But you and we are not getting the full picture. So um, <clears throat> this is similarly when we say to take care of this seat, we talk about this, we are talking about this, the compassion. When we take care of this seat, means protect this seat. How are we going to protect this seat? The, this seat is not that the, uh, like the, the real uh, seed, that flower, uh, that a, a fly comes and takes away this seed, not that kind of seed. This is something that your inner this uh, obstacle can come and take this seed away from you. So this kind of protection we need from inside. So that's why we have the Vinaya Sirve, the Vinaya, and then uh, mostly here we we will talk about uh, the the third chapter in Bayuda. No, uh, the second chapter is about the ethical conduct. So all is this to not make our life difficult. It is to show you how to protect yourself. So if it is something to protect, sometimes you feel like it's difficult. Yes, it should be difficult because you are challenging with your old version of you. That means it's something that you feel, I don't want to be under the sway of this kind of negative emotions. I want it to overcome. So difficult is there. But every time we challenge this difficulty, it's like a game. If the game is boring, there's no challenge, and no, there's no win-win, and it's not fun. So sometimes we lose, sometimes we win. But we need to get a trophy. That's it, isn't it? <laughs> now I'm going into the football. <laughs> so uh, that's why uh, some in the Bodhisattva's prayer, there are so many bodhicittas. Like we talk about uh, 22 types of bodhicittas. Right? But there are some bodhicittas are something like, mm, may I remain in this samsara or all this world and I will let other people go ahead and I will stay, stay still for each and every being. I wanted to stay. I don't want to become a Buddha. I first push them. Why this is in this there? Because it is like a very genuine dhruva tango genuine feeling, it comes up. Like, I wanted to help each and... Uh, one great master said, why, why so hurry to become Buddha? <laughs> because if you become Buddha, you have to do the same work you are doing. And you are not Buddha, you can still do the Buddha's work. So why hurry? This needed to be asked again to ourselves. So that means People who has so much kind of, too much actually, too much uh, feel to, no, I want, to, on the, I want it to be on the path of no more learning. <laughs> For these people, this is, I think, especially made this kind of bodhicitta. So then the person will just think like, okay, no rush. I don't want to skip the good parts. Otherwise, I will skip many things. So this is, I think, uh, necessary to think like this. But sometimes it helps me, so that's what I'm sharing. Pato ke chewa, tamar ke chewa. Okay. That is how it is. Then, that chewa did chewa, no? Tango ngā shin ta la shin ju jin, da ji di shi ngun la cha jewa. Su jun shi ta rangā mea pa jin, dola nīng ji ju gān te ra du si. That the Ninji Ninjilia 
now, remember she read verse number three, which reads, just a sec, I'll give you the translation. First, with the thought, I am, they cling to a self. Then, with the thought, mine, they become attached to things. Like buckets on a water wheel, they turn without control. I bow to the compassion that cares for such suffering beings. That's verse number three. And after Rinpoche described three types of compassion previously, well, here the text describes another way of classifying compassion, classifying great compassion. So the classification given here is described as compassion that takes merely sentient beings as the object. That's the first type. The second type is compassion that takes phenomena as a reality, or takes phenomenal reality, if you like. And the third type is compassion that takes no reference as its object. Okay, I'll say it again slowly. <laughs> so first, compassion, I'm using the terminology as used by Tupta Jimba, so it's a little longer than usual. Compassion that takes only sentient beings as its object. Compassion that only focuses on sentient beings. That's the first type. The second type is compassion that takes phenomenal reality. That focuses on phenomenal reality. That focuses on phenomena, as it's also called. Phenom that takes phenomenal reality as its object. And the last type is described as Compassion that takes no reference as its object. Compassion that takes no reference as its object. Yeah, a little uh, wordy. Anyway, those are the three types of compassion described in the following verses. And Rinpoche explained, first you need to generate the first time, the first, the first type. The first type of compassion that takes merely sentient beings as its object. Then you, you generate compassion that takes phenomenal reality as its object. And lastly, you generate compassion that takes no reference as its object. Mm. <laughs> Jigdani Kichi Artibus. 
Now, Rinpoche gave the following explanation with regard to, well, first, compassion that just takes sentient beings as its object. Well, we have a hard time generating that type of compassion, focusing on the suffering of other sentient beings and wishing them to be free from that, simply because we are usually so busy with ourselves, we're so busy with our own problems, with our own situation and so forth. Therefore, it's really difficult for us to focus on others and focus on their well-being and so forth. Our outlook is very narrow. It's very narrow-minded. And thus, it's so much harder to, therefore, be concerned for the welfare of others. And the reason is that we have this mind, we have this uh, wrong view that perceives the self in a way in which it doesn't exist. So remember she used the term, the view of the transitory collection, which basically means a mind that perceives this transitory collection of mind and body, I mean everything that makes up a person, and on top of that has a sense there's this intrinsic I. And as a result of that, unrealistic sense of an I, there's, a, uh, there's self-centeredness. There's a type of attachment to oneself and one's own well-being. And that keeps us from focusing on others. We are mainly focusing on ourselves, we're busy with ourselves, and we have a hard time to extend that focus towards others. But uh, once we understand, once we, we are able to expand our compassion and, and reduce that self-centeredness, we will see that other sentient beings are likewise under the control, or as Rinpoche called it, under the sway of this self-centeredness, under the sway of this misperception, that root or basic misperception with regard to the self. And then based on that, then our self-cherishing or self-centered attitude. And we can generate compassion towards them in the sense that there's no control, there's no real freedom. That sentient beings, as myself, 
under the control of this basic misperception and then self-centeredness and attachment, etc. They just follow naturally. And I, there, we also get a sense that there's no real difference between I and other sentient beings, that they're equally important as myself. That it's just this misperception that generates the sense in my mind that I'm more important, that I'm higher, that, I'm, that my happiness is more important than that of other sentient beings. But with practice, understanding the predicament sentient beings face in terms of being controlled by their afflictions and therefore experiencing unwanted sufferings, I generate a sense these are my sentient beings. They're part of me. The separation is no longer there. And we're able to work hard uh, for the benefit of sentient beings. But as Lama Tsongkhapa mentions uh, as a kind of summary of the section in the text that sets forth compassion that takes sentient beings as its object, there are two aspects mentioned that you specifically focus on in order to generate compassion. One aspect is to work on cultivating the sense of endearment when it comes to sentient beings, to see sentient beings as dear and precious, to see them as lovable and have a sense of endearment, a sense of closeness towards sentient beings. That is the first uh, aspect, if you like, that is necessary in order to generate compassion. And the second aspect is to consider the fact that sentient beings have no freedom that they are under this way, under the control of other factors, unwanted factors. So in the sense, this term of being under the sway, of being under the control of, is an important term uh, in, in Buddhist, in, in, in Buddhist um, philosophy in the sense that, well, being under the control of something, there's very little freedom. And what are sentient beings under the control of? They're under the control of their afflictions, such as attachment and so forth, and the karma that they accumulate as a result of that. So they're under the control of karma and afflictions. So in a sense, it's kind of like you can't blame them. If, they, if they're under the control of these aspects, they just can't help it. There is no freedom. So in a way, you can't blame them for the situation they're in. And on that basis, therefore, in that sense of endearment and understand the understanding of how they're under the control of these aspects of these, uh, well, karma and afflictions, then compassion can arise. Mm -hmm. This, uh, I uh, sometimes feel like this is a so basic and so uh, important for people like us uh, to have this practice uh, because uh, especially this uh, this is really powerful when we think we are controlled or the, under the sway of the negative emotions so this is why we always say awareness is really important uh, and uh, sometimes we say mindfulness so this is uh, really necessary because Actually, this whole teaching is teaching you how to be honest. <laughs> uh, why I'm saying this, uh, this happens to me, it's happened, it's happening. So I'm pretty sure this all is, uh, t you have this experience. For an example, if I got at some difficult with my friends and then got into a fight and then not physically <laughs> that's that's it, dangerous but morally like the different thoughts and then different points of view and then like say okay okay so then we stopped talking for a few days and then came together and apology and all this starts again at that time I Occasionally, I uh, re recognize this uh, you know, being the, under the sway of 
the negative emotion is so tricky because um, how I try to apologize to others is something like, well, I don't have intention to do this, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know what really happened. It's something came into me. I have all this to ask for forgiveness to others. I use this very, it's not, it's, it's true actually, we use this. But if somebody says, and we are not taking this seriously, it's like, I know, I know he would say like this, but I know what is, he has so much towards me and uh, now he's just playing with words. We feel this. So that's why we are being always, when somebody asks for forgiveness, we are hard as a rock just sitting like this. So I think uh, why we cannot accept the apology from others like this, because we are not recognizing. We are not giving the same position to what you have. You, don't, you cannot offer this to others. You are so grasped towards yourself. That could be the one reason. So next time, if you have some uh, problem with others, bring your full awareness and maybe uh, you can experience this one. <laughs> Okay, so uh, as the, the first, the uh, uh, merely, merely, uh, only focus only on sentient beings, though. only focusing on sentient beings, compassion, right? This compassion takes sentient beings as its object. Oh, uh, sen taking sentient being as the object of the compassion, this particular the compassion is just not to think about, oh, sentient beings, oh, made they get rid of from the suffering, not only this. So these uh, two, uh, two aspects of uh, two focuses to practice. Uh, first, we need to make very dear, sentient being very dear to you, one. Secondly, because of the core, oh, the seeing, as you being controlled by the self-grasping, and then you have to accept they are also uh, grasped or controlled by grasp the self-grasping. So you get, uh, you, you, are, you are wrong because of self-grasping, and they are wrong because of the self-grasping. So easy. So need some push in your mind. Bring this practice. Then it will become very easy to bring the first compassion. The first compassion is over. Okay. That any chill may be ninji. The chill may be ninji, the ninji mushibich. The number of pandan dao chow with the young. Tom, get down to the cabbage of red away. Chuchi Angi Simjana, Ning Jingama won the song of Tony, that Ning Jingama the won the song of Tony, and eh? Ta Simjangi Simjang to me, no to so the Kajadusna Tangzing Wongi Rishas Tangzing Wongi Rishas said to Tempe, and it Tangzin de la Taraman Puchi Kayonch Tangzin the Tanzin Trashu de Data Tanmimin Mingi said the Kadu Yungure de so than the Diga so that Medabe Samutri. Jazanga Tacronzo di Tes Tacro Chagui Mikanche, Midabi Samlo di Narola, and Zutnum Gi Tamer Rapasse Churba, Consult Tamer Rapasse, Samlo di Narola, Zu Midabi Quad, Shushum Shujior, Tame Dinana. Cajan Senata, Tanda Dinan, Summon Nashin, Anni, Simjin, Tata, Tamje, Anni Chu, 
چه دوست تماج دوست یا بی نه چه دوست ده دی دو زن به آنی دعوت دعوت به سیوشی بچه شده بچه چه دی تماشی بچه چه دوست ده دی دو آنی چه دی به دو چه چه تیم بچه بود ده دی بچه کلا آنی لون سیوشی دیابیون دو زن به کلا یا کارس اینچی که من رینگلز ریپلز ریپلز او دیگه لابچیک لیمون دو زن به چودی کران چیکی کسی یوادی تون یوره چو یوادی این چو یوادی تون دو زن به تا سه نالوله یا پنجم دوباره چه بگی دام سان دیپه دیگه تون کاری کوچیار سی دو زن به آن برای سه میان تام چه آنکو دارم با دنبو تریزو دنچ چیگه یه ماره ده اینا لگا کانچی چی چه بگی نه کلون کانچی چی چه بگی نه Takpa tempo terusu suci kan eh dia besun dua besi kan eh, ane cakap monsun ke leh tu tu kotu kotu us. Di ini tu sampai angan rawat dia tak tamjil. Nih kerja ni cik tu us. Di tu sampai koran tu ke cik cik dah tu zindan rawat dia. Takpa sih buji kan eh zin wajib. Tempo sih buji kan lah. Ah, tu kan ni tengah tu cik le senyap tu cik tu. Dengi yo me ha ko ma le segre de ina yo sem na lo la pe ha se de dur mu shu kan tu de lo ni chi dan de gi ta ji na ma zu me su ne ta yo me da wo son lo ji xian de do a che zang ge de de gi me da be gi ni zu de ha mo go be to ne ani cha da mo su de gi do su de wo de zang be ni ani sem jian de da tam jian le ning ji ge ya de kari gong ge se de kun zu me da ba la Takpor zinci, ini sem cuba suci mesti yang dos, jadi ni ni yang jik dos. Tadi penyang ni apa suci tua? Yes. Now as the first type, well, the first type just focusing on sentient beings. Then with regard to the second type of compassion, compassion that takes phenomenal reality as its object, or compassion that focuses on phenomena other than sentient beings. So. Here, in this case, Chandakirti, um, he's, when he describes the other types of compassion, actually, uh, it becomes obvious how beautiful his writing is. I mean, what a poet he is, in the sense that he gives a wonderful description of the environment. Um, he has the skill to kind of uh, describe this beautiful environment, and he uses that as an analogy to point out our mistaken views with regard to sentient beings or with regard to reality. Now, having generated the first type of compassion first, so you generate compassion that focuses on sentient beings and wishes them to be free from suffering, the next step is then to become aware of the fact that we are all controlled by our misperception with regard to the self. We all misperceive the self, ourselves and other sentient beings. We perceive a self that doesn't exist. But in order to understand that, there are different levels. There are coarser levels and there are subtler levels. So when we speak of understanding how phenomena really exist, we call that selflessness. So the absence of a certain self. But there's a coarser type of such an ab absence of a self, and there's a subtler type. The coarser type relates to impermanence in the sense that we have a sense, and this is just on a coarser level, we have a sense that we don't change. Other people don't change. Things don't change. We hold on to permanence that things remain the same. And here the analogy uh, Chandakirti gives, so think of this beautiful place, you're in this, in this calm, quiet place at a lake at night. The lake, the water of the lake is, the lake is very clean, the lake is very still, and the moon reflects, reflects in the surface of the water. And then think there is like a, a cool wind, a cool breeze, which starts to move the water so that ripples, ripples start to arise, ripples in the, uh, in, in the sea. 
So those ripples are here the analogy for sentient beings. The ripples indicate movement, indicate change. Moment by moment, the water is different. The movement is what, what happens in the water is different. So it's the, the momentary change that things undergo are like these ripples in the lake. So likewise, all sentient beings, they change all the time. There is nothing that remains the same from moment to moment. Things change all the time. However, we have this instinctive mind that grasps at permanence, that grasps that which is impermanent to be permanent. Of course, we may say, yeah, things change. Yeah, they change. They don't stay the same. But instinctively, we don't really feel that to be the case. We have a sense one moment to the next that things remain the same, whereas in actuality they're constantly changing. So we hold on to permanence, we hold on to um, phenomena remaining the same. And so now compassion that takes phenomenal reality is based on the compassion for all sentient beings but it is combined with, it is conjoined with an understanding that phenomena of the sentient beings are constantly changing, which is a powerful antidote to our coarser sense, our coarser misapprehension that perceives an unrealistic self. So what does this... <clears throat> Unchanging. So we, uh, it's called seeing the things as a, in, uh, it's a permanent, as a permanent. No changing. But we can argue with uh, great Chandakirti saying, no, 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 we see change. We see cl climate change. <laughs> now, like, uh, in Dharamsala, uh, for uh, it's a really funny weather because I uh, I thought the winter is finished, and then put all my uh, the winter stuff inside, and then after a few days weather changed, then I have to take it out. So it's the fourth time. So today, fourth time, I have to bring out all my blankets and everything. So these kind of change we see. And then, uh, so we can see, like, we, we celebrate birthdays. So it's more like, like because of the big change, <laughs> because of, uh, I didn't have a birthday party, I turned uh, 30, 39 now. Uh, it is really hard to not to be 39. <laughs> <laughs> but have to accept, <laughs> yes, I'm 39. And the difficult will be 40 now. <laughs> so on the 40th birthday, I don't want to put 40 on my birthday cake. <laughs> Just one candle. <laughs> and some people have a difficulty with the because, and then that's why uh, in the West, mostly it is, will be very rude to ask, how old are you? That will be something. Answer will be not really good. So it is more like, <clears throat> I think, we see some changes for sure. That's what not uh, what uh, Chantakiti is focused on. So I checked with my, my teacher. So that really changes, amazing that, uh, a great uh, the masters always say, if you really wanted to meditate on impermanence, then you have to go somewhere, maybe there's a waterfall. And then when you see a waterfall and then you meditate there, you will see some uh, sign of impermanence. So with this kind of instruction, not having the full instruction, I went <laughs> to box of fall, waterfall, box of waterfall. Anybody went to Box of Waterfall? Uh, oh yeah, so. 
And then when, and there are lots of tourists. So I just move a little bit ahead and there's no much people there. Then I may try to meditate. I see a waterfall, that's it. And then I see, yeah, the water is falling. So uh, I went to my teacher and said, I didn't see him uh, in permanence. <laughs> and then my teacher said, well, if you look at the water, this water you're following, the following, following Silve, yeah. And then you see, ah, oh, the water is falling. And then you look at the, the top water is falling, then still you're thinking, that waterfall is still falling. But you will never feel what you just saw this water, it's already down there. It reached somewhere else. And some people is washing, some people is flushing, some people are uh, enjoying, or whatever they are doing. So it's used, it's, it's running, it's already gone. So fast. So it's, but what we see is still there, still there. So now, um, uh, in, in the Buddha's teaching, the subtlest uh, that uh, in permanence is taught something like, I will say this in a Tibetan, otherwise I don't know how my English will help me or not. Pena, um, this is what I said. That, no, it's what I said. I said, 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 그냥 군인 개와 차서 또 딜랍 두고 요 말았다. 딜랍 살 레비나 아니 런싱기 샘나로 남라 치슈 카르드 전에 아메 차소세. 삼로들이 도와. 뒤에 두 선배가 저기 아드마세 켈렌 고에디 내가 딜가 두고 와. 그래서 다 디켈렌 투 저장 오디리아 다 구조가 좀 당도 요 말. 저는 좀 딘디기 모르 요 요르스. 디 마르스 and the second question of the Yerbe gave the young Adi, Tanding Adi Marek to touch you. This is the insumna Madevic Lidwa. D in Duzambe touches and got dig dig coronta, old you women do stay on Duzambe and tell it them be any, not a good jabs, not this grasp, chechy any, Azumasone, Masanin, any Higmarta set, a Keo Mariset, on a pe, Jasher Tang and Samalo, yeah, Missibi Mumba. The digital tenny, young, uh, leather, lea sire, lane of a sire. Yapuch and then the digger, young, go to Jashi River. The Induzambe, draw you, chew, dang in the water, yoder, yose, chick house, yod, yode, yorete, the how come into Ninja, said the Ninja Nibachar. Yes. Now, uh, with regard to subtle impermanence, so impermanence on the subtlest level. It needs to be explained in the following way. So we have a sense that in terms of our entity, we're always the same. And then some aspects, they change. So there's a sense that I remain always the same, but a few things concerning myself, my body, my mind, and so forth, they are changing. However, that is unrealistic because actually that self that I believe to be remaining, we believe to be there the next moment, well, it's actually not the same self, in that I can't say that the self a moment ago is the self that it's now. Yesterday's self is not today's self. It's a different type, it has changed. So nothing remains from moment to moment. So in terms of the self, it does not remain the same from moment to moment. However, there are some philosophers, especially some of the non-Buddhist Indian philosophers, who would find that scary. Oh, if myself yesterday is not today's self, so I'm not me anymore. 
and there's a sense you're losing yourself. So myself is gone because yesterday's is gone. And so that means there's no longer a self. And according to some of the non-Buddhist philosophical schools, they would say the self is permanent. There's something that continues on. But that's actually not in accordance with reality from a Buddhist point of view, from the point of view of like, yeah, we call it the self from moment to moment, but it's always a slightly different self. Yesterday's self is not today's self, and today's self is not tomorrow's self. And in that sense, it's not permanent. But we grasp at that self, at that sense of an I that seems to not be changing all the time. And based on that sense of permanence, then attachment arises, uh, aversion arises, and other afflictive emotions arise. And those give rise to certain karmic actions, certain motivated volitional actions. And if they were all positive, it'd be okay, but there are also harmful actions which then result in suffering and so forth. Which is why it's important to understand it's on the basis of our not understanding the subtle change of phenomena, the constant change of ourselves, the environment and so forth, that many different afflictions arise. And thus it's important to understand impermanence here in connection with focusing on the suffering of sentient beings and thus in connection to compassion. Tandic, <laughs> Yes. So what's important to understand in this context is uh, the, the concept of a continuum, a continuum, which means that the I, the self, for instance, it consists of many different moments that are not the same, and these moments form a continuum. So it's not that one moment I become not myself. It's not like from moment to moment. So one moment there's the self and the next moment I disappear. That would be extreme in that, yeah, the, the self would disappear. There wouldn't be a self any longer. This is not what this is saying when we talk about things changing all the time. There is a continuum of moments, each moment being different than the other, but we still call this the I. We still apply the, the term I to these moments of self. And each moment being individually different, but they all form what is called a continuum. So this continuum is the basis of our mistaken view. In actuality, there's a continuum made of moments which are ever-changing. However, on the basis of that ever-changing continuum, we wrongly perceive a non-changing self that is always the same. And that's the mistake. That's mm -hmm. the wrong view of permanence. Mm -hmm. Simjinti do what does a matoni, a tower zinchi, a lesser call a camp dishas, then you would chair. That somebody may go the same general and judge, turn number carded the sooner. That did it, Migua, Migua Mabel, Migua Mabela, Migni, and Ninji get on the river. Turn number the Carchazo said to Migua Mabel, me. What did you get, Sunjana? 
so, um, well, with regard to now the second type, the second type of compassion, therefore, compassion that takes phenomenal reality as its object, sometimes it's described uh, by way of saying the, the, that was just the focal object as sentient beings, but the aspect is impermanence, which it's a little difficult to understand, so I asked Rinpoche whether I could explain it in a slightly different way, the way it's usually explained, and Rinpoche agreed that I would do that. So actually what it means is you generate the mind that focuses on sentient beings and wishes them to be free from suffering. So basically compassion, the way we explained it earlier. But then you also generate another mind that focuses on the fact that perceives sentient beings as impermanent. And those two minds, they influence each other now. The mind that understands that sentient beings are impermanent now influences also the mind that has compassion towards sentient beings. So the, the, usually it's described as they are conjoined now. They affect each other. It's not saying that one mind focuses on all sentient beings and wishes them to be free from suffering and that the same mind also realizes the impermanence of sentient beings. No, it's two minds, but they work with each other. They work in tandem. They, they uh, influence each other. So that is with regard to compassion that takes phenomena or phenomenal reality as its object. With phenomenal reality here referring to impermanence. There are also other phenomena, but here mainly impermanence is mentioned. And then you have compassion that takes no reference as its object, which is, again, you have ordinary good old compassion, focusing on sentient beings, and now you take no reference to sentient beings, which Rinpoche will explain now what that means, taking no reference to sentient beings. <laughs> Is whether two mind, one mind. In a, in the Tibetan, it is really good uh, the anila we uh, try to translate. So that means like what with other people who does not have this background of the Tibetan terminology, how to represent that. That I just felt like, oh, this is something new. This is something I I should know <laughs> because it's not talking about one mind. It is talking about like, maybe let's put it in a very simple way. Uh, it's, you have a goal, you have a aim that you want to become rich. And then just saying like, oh, I love to become a billionaire, millionaire, doesn't make you billionaire, millionaire. But then you have to do something for this. So what makes you work for the sentient being is the mind, the second mind helps you to generate more. Seeing, oh, why I wanted to help them is because they are suffering. So not, don't stop there because keep this in your mind because this is like, what should I do now? This will come up. So then answer is there already. So unless I don't get this kind of mind, then I cannot help. So this is why I have to generate this. So the compassion helps you to become stronger, not weaker. So uh, this is good. So now let's focus on the third one. Uh, <coughs> no reference to the No reference to it. Now let's uh, bring the, um, the example where Chandrakirti wrote this uh, text and then he said about 
the timing is around like a, a night time because he said there's moon. <laughs> so <laughs> that means at night time. And then there is a, uh, a, a lake, uh, very clear, so that reflection of the moon is can seen very clearly. And then the, uh, the, the uh, and then a wind or the breeze come and then uh, there is a karsat and the ripples. ripples are there. So having this understanding of the second one. So now the third one. One could say like, oh, descendant beings does not recognize not understanding of the real moon, but they are so attached to the reflection. This is uh, one way of thinking. But more powerful way of thinking is uh, why the second one, the, why they cannot see the, uh, the movement, the changing of this uh, water and how they see still, the water so still, is because they already have uh, so much gr the grasp towards that moon is real. Right? Mipu um, I forgot to mention something Rinpoche said earlier and I forgot to translate that actually. Rinpoche said, uh, the words being are like reflections of the moon in rippling water, seeing them as fleeting. So up to there, the text describes compassion or pays homage to compassion that takes phenomenal reality. And then the last, ver ver the last words of the second line of this fourth verse of the text says, seeing them as devoid of intrinsic nature. So not just seeing them as fleeting and thereby indicating the impermanence of sentient beings, but also seeing them as devoid of intrinsic nature. Now what Rinpoche explained with regard to this is the, sec the third type of compassion. Compassion that takes no reference to its object. Again, we go back to the analogy of the moon you visualize the moon um, and the ripples in the water, with the ripples in the water indicating the fact that sentient beings are impermanent, which we need to understand to generate compassion in the, in the most effective way. But the second analysis is here of seeing the moon in the water but being fooled by the appearance believing the reflection to be the actual moon. And this is the analogy for the way we perceive phenomena, including the self, other sentient beings, on the subtlest level, believing there to be an independent self. And on the basis of that subtle misperception, that perception that there is a self for others and for ourselves, a, a self, that doesn't actually exist, an independent self. Based on that misperception, then other misperceptions, such as the mind that perceives a person to be permanent, arises, and all other afflictive emotions arise. Therefore, the deepest wrong view we all hold is the view that there is an independent self. And the third type of compassion now is the type of compassion that, again, 
compassion as your basis, which is then conjoined or influenced by a mind that knows that sentient beings don't exist in that way, that knows the subtlest selflessness of beings, or the subtlest uh, way in which the self actually exists, not as an independent entity. Mm -hmm. oh, only <laughs> Ning ダワディダワチニバデレメドクセチタディタディネアパネダワチャベケスキルトヤンゴツゴレジェザンガダワチニバディザワニネトンドスタンダワチニバディカレドセドセンベタダワチニバスネドダダチニタダチニタダチニタ
Karsorita, the opposite carrier. Uncommon, or Tintesicane, and not to win situ. Tashine, uh, get some of that? Some of Sabreta, Lusawa, Sam Sawa, and she knew what the Jetanga Tonam said you. That she knew that one of the Papa Charis. The name of the Manda Charis. That extraordinary Charis. What a dear. Thank you, Miss. Sonia <laughs> 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 types of compassion, especially to the second and the third type, are these correct understandings, are the correct minds that perceive sentient beings the way they perceive, uh, the way they exist. One being the impermanence of sentient beings, and the second being the actual way in which their self exists, which is that it lacks existing independently. So on the basis of that understanding, so once we've generated these three types of compassion, we now, as a practitioner, we generate now, or we cultivate now, the path of accumulation and the path of preparation. So in other words, great compassion is the driving force, and based on that driving force, you understand sentient beings are impermanent, and you understand that sentient beings don't exist the way they appear to our mind as existing as independent entities. First, you generate the path of accumulation, then the path of preparation. The second path, or the second level of a bodhisattva is called preparation because it is a preparation for the path of seeing, the third level. On the third level, you realize you understand, you, you realize that other sentient beings, that is the self or the different selves, don't exist the way they appear, but you realize it directly. You have a direct experience of that. A direct uh, experience of how phenomena actually exist. So for the first time, you have a direct experience. Previously, it was merely conceptual, now it's a direct experience. You directly have um, realization of how sentient beings actually exist. So it's like now you know that although this reflection appears to be the moon, it's not the moon. It appears to be the moon, but it's not. The, the self, the self of, of, of sentient beings appears to be an independent entity, but you realize that can't. That can't be possible. And on the basis of that now direct experience, you can now uh, move towards the path of meditation. You remove, um, you remove the wrong view with regard to that. And you understand that on the basis of the parts of a sentient beings, which is called the basis of imputation, the basis of labeling person, these parts, mind and body, that on the basis of that, there is no, based on that, there is no independent self, a separate kind of concrete self. You realize that that is not the case. And in that way, uh, you are able to now overcome this mistaken view and the different afflictions that arise from that mistaken view. You accumulate a lot of what is called positive potential, you generate a lot of virtue and you move on to the path of seeing, uh, sorry, to the path of meditation. 
after the path of seeing, after that direct experience, now you familiarize yourself on the path of meditation with that direct experience of reality and accumulate more positive potential, more virtue, etc. Uh, so giving you the support so that eventually you attain the enlightened state of a Buddha. So you have different sub-levels of the path of meditation because you now need to familiarize uh, step by step more and more with that direct experience, accounting for these 10 levels on the path of meditation. And so what happens is that you understand that phenomena do exist, but they don't exist in the way in which they appear. And you replace now your incorrect perception of reality with a correct perception. So a new mind arises, remember what you said. It's a new mind. The previous mind was contaminated, polluted, if you like, polluted by the misapprehension of reality, by seeing things always in a slightly skewed way, in a slightly mistaken way. And so now that contamination is removed and a new mind, an extraordinary mind arises that has never arisen in your mental continuum. You've never had that mind that is based on a correct perception of reality. And that correct mind also gives rise to a new body. So you basically become a new person <laughs> with a, a changed mind and a changed body based on your correct understanding. Mm. So do you want to become the new person or not? <laughs> <laughs> That all goes to the, uh, the question and answer of the compassion. So how much you want this? So right now it sounds like, okay, there's something like this. Okay, there's not much feeling there. So it all goes back to the, the compassion. So more why you need a new way of understanding, new form, a new uh, path. All this is, uh, comes with how much your compassion is supporting you. So this is necessary. Okay. So now it's uh, uh, almost three. So we have 30 more minutes, I guess. And then if people have some questions, that will be good to discuss. Any kind of questions? And the best will be questions related to the, what I said, and then, or else you have something in mind, we can discuss. Okay. The questions about three bodhicitta you have a seed, um, water in the seed, and have the planet, but three are important. Is there any priority how? how different, how important one from the another stage or they are equally important? Okay, okay. Um, Sabyan tabu, shu tabu, devo mimba tabu. What do you think? I think the, the first stage might be the most important without the first, the others would not come. Hmm. Uh, but they are maybe as, as similar as important. But, hmm. but the, the last stage, I, try and, I, I don't understand that much so because you have to harvest Mm -hmm. If you don't mm -hmm. harvest, mm -hmm. so that part. yeah. Mm. <clears throat> In order to let's say something like this. In here, Dharamsala, the avocado, 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 avocado. I don't, I don't know how to pronounce that. <laughs> the, that fruit is quite rare. And then some people don't like it, some people like it. So some of people I met in Dhamsala, so they, because they like the avocado so much, and then they try to, uh, they have lots of seed, and then they, they never give up. 
and then there's monkeys coming, and then they protect it, and they do so many things. So unless that person does not have, doesn't like the avocado, the, the fruit itself, then he might not put lots of effort of this seed. So similarly, uh, it is necessary to see uh, what is Buddha, fully enlightenment, what is the liberation, why this is so important, and then once you see this is so necessary to you, then ultimately you will feel like, can I get this? Do I have ability of this? And then we call the nature, the Buddha nature. Then we will start to like, uh, start to care about this. And then uh, you see some improvement, improvement in your life. You feel like, I'm so happy because I'm moving towards one day closer to, the, uh, to become fully enlightened. This is what we get. It's like a, uh, you see small plant, uh, plants, not plants, uh, leaves coming out, the green things, then you feel, yeah, now it's coming out. So we have the joy. And we will never complain about all the work because of the, you really wanted to see the, the fruit. And then the beauty is you will, you will go through lots of uh, struggle. You have to struggle a lot but you will never feel you are of this struggle in your mind because how much you like the, the, the fruit itself to, to become Buddha. So many, many, uh, in, the, in the text it says like, uh, why right before this uh, text, it is talk, it talked about the three indicator, the three phenomena indicated here. Oh, oh you get it? <laughs> I'm not going to repeat that. <laughs> okay. So compassion, the non-dual cognition, and bodhicitta. Oh, bodhicitta. So there, why it's said it before, so then we get the taste, taste of what is liberation what is uh, the fully enlightenment. When bodhicitta, we talk about bodhicitta, we need to, uh, we need to become a, feel like to become a Buddha. And when we talk about uh, the, uh, where was that, uh, Ningji, uh, renunciation or the compassion, then we need, we need to feel, I wanted to get out from the suffering looking for a uh, liberation. And especially when we talk about bodhicitta, ultimately we have to feel the self-cherishing, how to reduce this. So all this, when you feel it's going on, this, like from A to Z, you feel this, then the road is so uh, clear, then you can run. Like in Germany, uh, I went there. There's a highway which doesn't have a speed limit. Speed limit. It's amazing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then, no problem. So uh, that's why it is a really good question that uh, it it. It is really important to see, not the, this is important and that. It is like an antidote. So, which you really need f the most? What urgently? What you need the most? You have to feel this, and then you can say, "Oh, then make a connection." Oh, in order to have this, I need to get this. Then in, in order to get this, I need this, so you can have this, uh, I don't know, causal chain, like this is so good. Okay. Uh, 
respond to all of it. Thank you. Oh, that's loud, sorry. Thank you for your teaching and thank you for your amazing translation as well. You have a real amazing energy there to receive all the beautiful knowledge. But my question is, from um, like from the perspective of living a life in, like for, say for example, the healthcare environment as a healthcare professional, where a lot of compassion is uh, required of you on an ongoing basis, and that environment you can feel the um, the effects of the of that and the negative, like the suddenly your compassion turns into cynicism or you know, just the negative emotions that come out of um, needing to have so much compassion. What are some, um, I want to use the word potent, but um, <laughs> just some practices or like, as you were talking about phenomena that help you um, maintain the compassion? Yeah. Mm. If, or just speak to that in general. Um, yeah. Maintaining mm. the compassion mm. and how to do Routine. that. This is a very precious question because most questions will be like how to maintain uh, compassion and bodhicitta. But your question is how to keep this compassion to do, not harming the compassion and then still moving on. That's a great thought. You can say great thought of the day. <laughs> um, now, I think uh, uh, if we look at it like this, most the compassion comes from the sentient beings. Without sentient beings, this beautiful mind for compassion will be not there. And then we meet other, uh, so many types of sentient beings. And then if our compassion is not strong enough, then we might feel oh, this sentient being is trying to destroy my compassion. But Bodhisattvas think, oh, this sentient being is making my compassion stronger. Like right now, when we, go, we went through this text, it says the real compassion, the most important compassion, here we can say most important <laughs> compassion, is when he, you, you see some faults in others, and then you say, oh, there are the, under the sway of the negative emotions. They might have like a temporarily like some problem with me, but how this problem comes into them is they are so uh, kind of a, uh, kind of diluted, and then the anger comes, and then they start attacking me and my friends and all others. So seeing this at the moment when you are going through a problem. You cannot bring a compassion and patience at the same time. You cannot say, wait, 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 I need to meditate. <laughs> it doesn't work like this. But the beauty is mostly in the West or East, when they come from work, they bring the problem to the home. But a practitioner should bring problem and then keep it in for yourself and you have an altar or a picture of your guru, or, or we don't need any picture or something, but you can just try to look inside yourself. That means 
today I got this, went through this problem. So now I'm going to meditate on this. That is called analytical meditation. Analyze. Oh, this person, he might be going through a rough day, time. And this, how it started, maybe he doesn't have any motivation. It's very clear. He doesn't uh, wake up in the morning, set an alarm clock and said, okay, uh, today I'm going to make somebody un very unhappy. Nobody is like this. So now we, some, but sometimes when we are so frustrated or unhappy, we don't have a time to think like this. We just like, why I do my best to him? Why he need to say this? Why he has to attack on me? You know, in the front of many people, why he has to do this? It comes like this, but not the other way around. So I'm saying, what is the beauty of this practice called emptiness or the impermanence? It gives you a power to, to see the situation from different angle. At the moment, we are so fixed, so that we, the practice cannot come. But if you try to move from, from that position to other position and you look at it, then you can see the picture more clear. So then we also call it this compassion. If we can put this kind of habit, like uh, uh, this uh, so-called awareness, it's beautiful because it happened with uh, one of my friends, uh, because he has a, he is not a good practitioner, uh, and he doesn't do like a regular practice or something, but that doesn't mean that he is not a good practitioner. But anyway, what really happened uh, is uh, he got into a fight in Meghalganj. You know where Meghalganj is. <laughs> and then he got into a fight, and then uh, they are about to fight like physically. And then what really happened is his teacher called at that time. And then his phone is in uh, his hand because he is going to fight. And then he saw his teacher calling him. And then he has a really mood to fight. Okay. And then he said, wait, wait, wait. I need to, to take this. This is really important call. Other person was waiting for the fight. <laughs> and then he was like, what really happened? <laughs> so then he talked and he said, okay, I will come right away. And then he said, today I don't have a mood to fight. So if you want to continue, you can come same time tomorrow here. <laughs> so that time he really proved that he's taking practice doing practice, bringing this awareness into him. So this happens to us, it will be difficult. Even our teacher calls, we will put the phone and we will, uh, whatever we have started, we will try to finish it. But he, that person, that my friend, normally I try to look down on him, oh, what are you doing? But that day he proved he is such a gr much greater than me. So that was a one great teaching from him. So I felt like I need this kind of realization. This kind of awareness is good. But if maybe other person look around, maybe he will, uh, they will think he is like a coward. But he's a strong man. He's great because his wish to fight was just like this, gone. And but his target is, my teacher is calling me, this is more important. He can change the angle very quickly. This is needed. So, yeah. If we have more people like him, then the world be, world will be much more better place. <laughs> okay. So I think one more question. Oh, yeah. You can. Yes. This one. Um, earlier today, you talked about the 
Buddha's son and that they left him on his way to enlightenment and that they did it to enlighten him. So it got me thinking about like saying someone today we, we did a similar journey about the prices. Like I was thinking both sides. It's very difficult for the family of both sides, but it got me thinking about like if it takes a long time, it, it takes a really, really, it could say that, I don't know, the family doesn't want it to, to get enlightened. It could tear it apart. It's, it tear it apart entirely. It's such a huge price to, to pay. And I'm, I was really wanted to hear your thoughts about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you think the Buddha when he first uh, he wanted to become Buddha I don't think he has he has in mind like I wanted to become the fully enlightened so called Buddha and then uh, all this Bhumi he didn't study like that so he might felt self-grasping is un, uh, unless I cannot take away the self-grasping, I cannot help my family. Even I stay with the family, the problem will start. Then uh, some problem will be always there. And then self-cherishing is one of the root cause it always make me to connect with the others. Unless I ten, cannot get this to rid of these two, I will be not happy. So then he said a journey to find how to reduce these two. And maybe Buddha didn't have a, like a, this is what we say called awfully enlightenment, sangi or tadagata. Maybe he does not have all this thing in his mind. His way of thinking is very simple. Then later, he, when he become fully enlightened, then he say, oh, if you wanted to become this, then you need to this. Then we add a little bit more on there. Then it looks like, oh, it really takes a lot of time. I, I cannot do this. But then, like, if you look uh, uh, back in Tibet, time of Marpa, Melarepa, all they are lay, pe- lay people with a family, but still they can practice, uh, they can give education to the children, and they can relate to the other neighbors very easily. And some people might not recognize he is a Buddha. It is not necessary, but he does whatever Buddha is doing, he is doing it and, uh, in a very simple way. So similarly, even in this now busy, crazy, little bit of crazy, uh, uh, this world, uh, we can, uh, we just don't need to try to find, like, to, I wanted to become Buddha, but we can just like see, how to reduce this kind of thing. And then we can see a clear picture, more clear picture. And then maybe one day we might not know how we become Buddha. But we might feel like, I wanted to be Buddha. And then it's long distance, uh, so much effort. Uh, sometimes it becomes very unhealthy. So it's better to see. So one time I, Ask my one of friend who always come to my class saying, well, we always talk about Buddhichita. So then is there some way, just not thinking of Buddhichita and then how you can feel that Buddhichita is really important. So that, my question was actually, uh, sometimes, we say bodhicitta is needed, it's like an optional. 
we don't see necessary. Then when we say, oh, this self-grasping or self-cherishing is really hurting me, and then you wanted to get rid of this, then it's the answer is, yes, that's the bodhicitta. So uh, I think uh, sometimes, uh, if we put it together, sometimes we should practice in a simple way, but it really contents the essence is there. So do you get it? <laughs> so it's related to uh, this topic. Um, because right now in this world, even the religion is designed to help people who are suffering. But then it, somehow through our attachment, we make our religion uh, polluted. What, uh, why this becomes so polluted is sometimes we feel like I'm a Buddhist. My work to, as a Buddhist is to serve my master. Uh, to make Buddha happy. That means build more temples, uh, recruit more monks and nuns. That could be sometimes go wrong. Like Buddha himself does not have any kind of a, uh, motivation to make so-called religion Bud Buddhism. Maybe uh, Jesus doesn't have a, a motivation to make a Christian entity. And Muhammad maybe does not have an intention to uh, make a Muslim. But he taught and then people start liking him and then slowly, slowly, and people came like, oh, this is our religion. And make so narrow. Ner not narrow like the inside here. So narrow. So this is this made diluted by our own attachment. So similarly, it is related to his question. So um, like when we do practice, we need to be practice very, very in a try to like a simple way, that not like. A, so most sometimes it is necessary to if somebody want to achieve bodhicitta, it is necessary to check how much self cherishing is really uh, taking my peace away. How the attachment is occupying my uh, inner peace. I'm not talking about liberation to become Buddha, but this is somewhere there. But it, our focus needs to be there. So and then once who, who is on that path, who is uh, become Buddha, then you will appreciate, oh, he's the one who passed this, and now I wanted to become him. Then it's very, picture is very clear. I wanted to become like you. Okay, uh, next question. Oh, go. Oh, I, see. So, I was thinking actually, um, so we should not focus on the end of the journey. So just get, improve every day, regardless of our religion or mm -hmm. beliefs, right? This mm -hmm. is the main idea. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to make that sure. Like, oh, okay. But you explained you the it. same thing. Thank <laughs> you so much. You are a quick learner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's a more, more important to keep in our mind will be, are you enjoying what you're doing? So uh, English terminology, joyous effort, does not, it has a quite good uh, translation of the Tibetan called Zundu, but it does not carry one thing, like 
virtues. Gewala. Virtues is not there. Joy is there. So I'm so happy. The joy. So most of most of us do practice, have lots of commitments. Joy is not there. So the effort is just a dry effort. And then we will not continue because we are not having the joy. So main the main reason to achieve shamatha is bring more joy. So plenty, uh, plenty, plenty. Uh, so it, that's why the great master uh, Shanti Deva, when he wrote a book of Way of Bodhisattva's Life, he may he, uh, he the first chapter is benefits. He's smart. He knows how to do the business. Like a like a the movie companies, they make a teaser, trailer, and the movie. So from the teaser, you they just show something, and then what oh, is there? It must be very good. So we need this. So it makes so much easier the customers, customer to viewers, the viewers audience. or the participants, the audience, the audience, the audience to get near to th to buy the tickets. <laughs> so Shandide wants to buy the tickets of the Bodhicitta. So. <laughs> so the the first business how it will it could be business is advertisement. 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 advertisement is saying, oh this benefit, benefit. There's lots of benefit of this. So we need to see this. So then it becomes much easier. Yeah. Okay. One more question then. I would love uh, to understand maybe how the perception of impermanence may make compassion more effective. Hmm. Maybe an example would help me. Okay, okay. Mm. Um, impermanence. Uh, if you get a f the full picture of impermanence, then it is uh, no question it will help you to uh, uh, bring better practice. But if you just get the picture only just saying, changing, dying, and then n nothing lasts forever, and then we will not appreciate that much. <laughs> so because our, we are taught from the, our childhood story, like Oh, they had this, 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 and then they lived forever. And then <laughs> we have this for it, right? And we have this because the human nature, we, we want this forever. But in permanence, is, we can feel some kind of opposite. But the reality, now we have to face the reality, but the Adults know that the, once they get happily married, the prince and princess got married, it doesn't stop there. <laughs> <laughs> A new chapter has begun. But the kid, the kid stops there like, oh, this is so good. You, you cannot confuse the child. So, but the adults know what's happening. 
So I think it is necessary uh, to come out from this fairy tale and then try to search for the truth. That means the reality. Unless we don't face the reality, and then we are, will be always deluded or we will not see what is coming up. And then there will be so much surprises, or not good surprise, bad surprise. <laughs> and then we will always think, why this is happening to me? Why only me? Actually not, it's not only you. The worst, there's so much worse than that. But you will feel like the world ends here. This all you, we have to try to connect through the impermanence. So once person has a, a, quite, a kind of a familiar with this practice of impermanence, then for that person, any kind of a situation happens. If something good happens, he can say, I appreciate the impermanence because this is going to be good. And then also he can say, I know this can happen because of the impermanence. So in a two ways, we can uh, use this way understanding of impermanence. But uh, our picture of permanent is like, we are only expecting for good, not the bad one. And then bad comes and then you will feel like, I cannot face this. So it is a matter of, uh, are you ready for, to see the reality of the nature? Uh, you uh, said share a story or example, right? Example. Oh, uh huh. What is a good example? <laughs> Anybody has a good example of impermanence? Maybe uh, if you hate something. Uh huh. Oh, can can you give the mic? He's on a deathbed. Uh, you know he's gonna die. Okay. So you better just. Leave uh -huh. that hatred, right? Uh -huh. Or impermanence is the state of mind. Uh -huh. So if you are angry, you know that guy is gonna be less angry next moment. Uh -huh. So let me wait. So maybe. Okay. So you wait for the other person to die? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> just, kidding. Yeah, just kidding. Just kidding. Two, just kidding. Two, two, two right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so I give two, two examples. Right? Just kidding. One example was if you're angry with someone, very angry, he did yeah. something wrong to you, but he's probably on a deathbed. Mm -hmm. So you just leave your anger because you know this, he will be there no more. That's a, one example of impotence mm -hmm. because we are in a constant state of change, right? Mm -hmm. So other example is two people are fighting, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Since we, we know every mental state is in a constant state of change. So mm. other person is gonna be, maybe you were, right now you're okay, next moment there's anger, mm. next moment there's possibility he will be calm. Yes. So you didn't need to feel resentment or something mm -hmm. like that. So because we know the state of mind is in a constant change. Mm. So let me wait, mm -hmm. calm, calm down. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, impotence in the states of mind or in the external mm -hmm. reality. Yeah? But this is a good one. This is a good one because um, as you said, if you have some kind of a, so much a kind of grudge inside you and then you hear that your enemy is having a difficult time. And then once you hear this shocking news, you feel like this crutch goes down very automatically. 
even though you will say, even though he wasn't as kind to me, I feel sorry for him. It comes up. Uh, and then also, um, like a friend, enemy, enemy, one win, why you feel so hatred? Because you feel like this enemy is like a permanent. You take this permanently. So once having a dialogue or some kind of things, miracle happens that you become two good friends, then another person will see, amazing, how could this happen? They are supposed to be enemies. So the second person who looks at the first picture is like fixed. But then you proved it's in permanence, this change better change can be happen. So this is also mm, uh, a sign of reality that can be ch changed. So those are the other kind of uh, thing, um, like a great uh, master who wrote the song of impermanence. Uh, the name is Kundang uh, Tebedrume a great Tibetan scholar. So he said, if you can look into, into the nature, the nature is always teaching you the impermanence. And sometimes it, now these days, it's the nature is showing the impermanence very quickly. <laughs> and then also he says, the impermanence shows that there isn't like a, a kind of a uh, uh, sequence. sequence of the age who will live long or who will go first or second. The saying that I have seen uh, a father or a mother crying because of the child. Uh, it's no more there. So all this if you look into this, so it is actually showing the reality. It doesn't mean like you need to see this and others will just go around like this. No, the reality is like this. So then your mind will be very, very, uh, once the mind is with the reality and then you can take everything very easily. So you make your own kind of world or like your expectation, your, or like everything will go very well, and then something big happens, then you are not ready for it. This side, you're only hoping for this side, and then a big shock, and then depression, anxiety, everything's going up. So yeah, I think uh, to practice in permanence means to stay with the reality and then fall in love with reality. Yeah, yeah, okay. Because compassion ultimately means compassion for yourself also. Okay, so now if we get angry against someone, so we'll also feel bad inside, right? Mm -hmm. So now we use impermanence to generate compassion. So. When we say the other person, his state of mind is going to change after some time. So let me wait. Mm -hmm. Why wait? Mm -hmm. Because if I don't wait, I will hurt myself. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So I'm getting compassionate to myself. Let me wait. Let him calm down <laughs> because mm -hmm. his state of mind is going to change. Mm -hmm. So in that process, what you're doing is you're being compassionate for yourself. Otherwise, if you get angry, mm. you're going to disturb yourself. Mm -hmm. So, no, this is a one, one way. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. OK. Uh, my lama sometimes talk uh, about uh, this impermanence. Uh, maybe uh, two people is uh, drink uh, coffee, and uh, one people is talking about uh, one 
people is don't like these people. Mm -hmm. And oh, don't talk to me about these people. I no want to, you not disturb me mm -hmm. talking about these people. And um, these people say, oh, but this pe another people is uh, talk very good with you, about you, and is uh, want offering you uh, some money. And in one click, mm. it's changed. Oh. And, uh, that proves he is a smart guy. And after he <laughs> uh, take coffee with him, and okay. when he is not with him, is uh, miss him, no? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then <laughs> before his enemy, mm -hmm. after he cannot stay yes. uh, without the mm -hmm. coffee. Oh, no, that, that's good. That's good. Okay, so we stop here today. Okay. To the Bodhicitta prayer. Mm. I don't know if you don't have it, I recite it in English so you can maybe then think about it. May the precious Supreme Bodhicitta not yet born arise. May that arisen not decline but increase more and more. And then the same for emptiness. May the precious view of emptiness not yet born arise. May that arisen not decline but increase more and more. Dimitri, <laughs> Okay, thank you. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs>